Tonight, breaking news. Another balloon spotted flying over the western U.S., raising alarms from coast to coast. The unidentified balloon arriving one year after that Chinese spy balloon flew across the continental United States. NORAD scrambling fighter jets to get a closer look at the object. Officials say this one does not pose a national security threat, but it's still unclear where it's from or what it does. Courtney QB live at the Pentagon with the latest. Also tonight, the major new evidence in Trump's election interference case in Georgia. The former president's legal team presenting new phone records alleging DA Fonnie Willis and special prosecutor Nathan Wade lied about when their relationship started. What those phone records show. Angela Sinadella standing by to break it all down. Plus the latest on that controversial IVF ruling in Alabama. Republicans, including former President Trump, now on defense, rushing to proclaim their support for IVF treatments. But parents and fertility clinics still worried about facing prosecution for trying to have their child. Our Yamish Alcindor on the ground in Alabama, speaking with families uncertain about the path forward. Punishing Russia, the U.S. announcing its biggest sanctions package against Russia since the start of the war in Ukraine. The measures targeting allies of Putin's war effort as the second anniversary of the invasion nears. And new details on that American ballerina detained by Russia, her boyfriend speaking to Top Story tonight, his desperate plea for her release. Deadly Inferno, the dramatic new images, a massive fire engulfing an apartment complex in Spain. First responders pulling residents out of windows to safety. At least 10 people killed. We'll have the latest on the search for the dozen plus still missing. Times Square stabbing, chilling new surveillance footage showing a migrant brutally beaten and stabbed. Just hours later, another man viciously attacked, police arresting 10 suspects, but still hunting for at least 16 more as violence escalates in the iconic New York City tourist attraction. An unlikely escape, a Michigan home going up in flames after a gas explosion. How the 76-year-old homeowner inside made it out to safety. Top story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Ellison Barber in for Tom Yamas. We begin tonight with that breaking news. An unidentified balloon flying over the western United States. That balloon spotted over Utah this morning at an altitude between 43 and 45,000 feet. NORAD scrambling fighter jets to check it out. Multiple U.S. officials telling NBC News tonight it is carrying a payload. They say it's about two feet square, but they do not believe it's a national security threat. But they also still do not know what it is exactly or where it originally came from. This incident comes a year after that Chinese spy balloon spent a week flying across the continental U.S. before being shot down over the Atlantic Ocean. That incident inflaming tensions between the world's two biggest superpowers. NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby joins us now from the Pentagon. Courtney, what's the latest you're hearing about this balloon? Do we know at all what it is? We don't. Uh, in a word, we do not. Now, I will say uh, the, the statement that we got out of NORAD, and, and according to a number of officials who we've been speaking with since this all unfolded in the last several hours, uh, they seem pretty confident that this, this balloon, this unidentified balloon, does not pose a national security threat, that it also doesn't pose a threat to aviation. As you mentioned, it's flying somewhere around 44, 45,000 feet in the air, um, but it's, and it's not maneuverable. So the officials say that it's actually flying, moving across the country with the jet stream and flying at the speed of wind. So uh, how this is different than that uh, high altitude Chinese spy balloon that we've, we've been seeing the video and the photos here on the screen is number one, it's simply not flying as high. It's about 20,000 feet lower than where that balloon was, but it's also dramatically smaller. Remember that balloon was described to, by many people as about the size of three school buses. Well, this one is much smaller than that. You mentioned the payload. It has a very small payload. And, and just for our viewers who may think, wonder what that, that means, that a payload can be something as simple as cameras or recording devices. But I will say the officials are not saying exactly what that payload is. But again, that they are saying it's not a national security threat. Now, in addition to that, while the NORAD and officials here at the Pentagon are not saying where that balloon took off from or who owns it, officials are telling us that the, the in, all indications right now are is it is not 
uh, part. It does not belong to a foreign government, Ellison. Okay, so Courtney, uh, the last time when there was the balloon spotted over the U.S., that one a Chinese spy balloon, there was a lot of discussion about when and how to shoot it down. Do we know if U.S. officials are considering taking this balloon out? So they don't want to take anything off the table, but I have to say I do not get any sense that there is real talk about shooting this one down, and in, in, in part because it's transiting over the United States. You'll remember that the, um, that the high-altitude Chinese spy balloon, one of the reasons that they did not shoot it down until it was over the ocean is they were worried about a debris field. But more than that, it isn't, this one is not assessed to be any kind of a threat. They still are monitoring it, the U.S. military is, to try to determine to see if there's anything that changes, if suddenly it appears that it begins to be maneuverable, if it changes course, anything like that. But but the officials are not really talking about any, about shooting it down at all, Allison. All right. NBC's Courtney Kuby at the Pentagon. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Now to our other major headline tonight, the developments in the Georgia election interference case against former President Donald Trump and the embattled Fulton County District Attorney prosecuting that case, Fonnie Willis. Trump's legal team presenting new phone records casting doubt on Willis's testimony about a relationship she had with the man she appointed special prosecutor to investigate Trump. His name, Nathan Wade. The Trump team had asked the judge to disqualify Willis from the case. They say she appointed Wade because the two were romantically involved and that Willis benefited financially from her then-boyfriend's appointment through vacations. They say he took her on. In the contentious hearing last week, both Willis and Wade took the stand vehemently denying all of those allegations. They say their relationship did not start until after his appointment in November of 2021 and that they split the cost of almost all of their trips together. Wade did say he visited Willis at her home before his appointment, but that it was not very often. Do you think prior to November 1st of 2021, you were at the condo more than 10 times? No, sir. So it'd be less than 10 times? Yes, sir. So if phone records were to reflect that you were making phone calls from the same location as the condo before November uh, 1st of 2021, and it was on multiple occasions, the phone records would be wrong? If phone records reflected that, yes, sir. They'd be wrong. They'd be wrong. But a new court filing showing analysis of cell phone data from Wade's phone allegedly demonstrates that he visited Willis at her home at least 35 times in the months before his appointment and in the weeks immediately after. Willis also addressed when their romantic relationship began directly. Here's that portion of her testimony. I'm asking you whether or not prior to November 1st of 2021, there was a romantic relationship with Mr. Wade. That's very simple. It's either a yes or a no. I don't consider my relationship with him to be romantic before that. But those records presented by the Trump team allegedly show that on multiple occasions in that period, Wade arrived late at night and stayed into the early morning hours. I want to bring in NBC News legal analyst Angela Sinadella to break down all of these developments. So, Angela, let's just start with sort of the obvious question. Went through all of it. It sounds like this is a pretty big deal. How damning are these records? Do they actually prove definitively that he was there prior to the dates that he previously acknowledged? So I wouldn't say they definitively prove, but that's not the burden that the judge has to decide. It's not definitively. It's just a question of their credibility. And really at this point, whether or not they lied on that stand. So. I think it seeds enormous doubt that this relationship started after he appoint she appointed him after she appointed him. I think it's pretty clear from this evidence that she appointed him prior to their relationship. Sorry, the relationship started mm -hmm. prior. Mm -hmm. But the biggest issue is that they presented in an affidavit, in a reply, and under oath, they testified to the fact in front of the court at the point at which this relationship started. So really their issue is if they lied to the court at all. They didn't necessarily even have to say that earlier. They didn't have to try to prove when the relationship started. They could have just focused on the financial aspect. They did not. They affirmatively put forth these, cl these clear definitions, these statements to the court. And if the judge decides that they were lying, that as officers of the
the court they lied, that's hugely problematic. So what would be your legal advice if you were working with and or representing both Nathan Wade uh, and also Fonnie Willis? How would you say they should move on from this? So there's a lot of options. First, they can argue that this shouldn't even be admitted as evidence, that it's an invasion of privacy, and the judge hasn't even decided yet whether or not to admit this as part of the evidentiary hearing. We will likely see that next week. Also, Fonnie Willis, when she was on the stand, said that they did have some sort of a relationship. Mm -hmm. They were friends. In fact, he was her mentor. So she could likely double down on that and say that they did have these late night conversations, these late night visits, but they were not explicitly romantic. And so at that point, perhaps the defense can't really prove further whether or not it was romantic. Nobody was in those conversations or in the room with them. So lastly, I think, though, they would redirect back to the financial issue. The reason why there's any possible conflict of interest is if she conferred a financial benefit. And she on that stand, I thought last week, did a great job claiming she did not at all, that she paid cash. She paid her way. Mm -hmm. So focusing back on that yeah. could be helpful. And when she was on the stand, too, she also made a clear point of saying, none of this is really even about me. Let's listen to some of what she had to say. You're confused. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. I mean, multiple things can be true at once, right? She is not on trial, technically speaking. But does this cause significant damage to her credibility, not just in this case with the former president, but moving forward? It causes huge damage, I think almost irreparable, dam irreparable damage any way the judge rules. Because let's say the judge does decide these records are enough to disqualify them from the case. Obviously, that is horrible for her. Now, on the other side, if the judge does not admit this into evidence or for, since for some reason decides it doesn't really affect their credibility, the juror pool out there is watching. And at the point at which the jury starts to doubt your credibility, doubt everything you would say on that stand or in front of them, trying to convince Vincent of an argument, you've already lost your case. How long do you think it will take the judge to decide whether or not these records can be admitted? Well, March 1st will be the closing argument. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we will likely hear both sides do a summary. And then the judge can either decide before that or after. And then he can give a decision within the week or within a couple weeks. So we never know. All right. Well, we will be watching. Angela Sinadella, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Now to the fallout from Alabama's Supreme Court IVF ruling. Outrage growing on the left after the court decided frozen embryos are children. While key Republicans, including Donald Trump, rushing to publicly voice their support for in vitro fertilization. And tonight, the state's IVF patients still left in the lurch as some providers pause procedures. NBC's Yamish Alcindor is in Alabama with the latest. After a week of confusion and frustration, tonight, Alabama's attorney general saying he has no intention to prosecute IVF families or providers. Just last week, the state Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos are children and that people can be held liable for destroying them. That set many Republicans scrambling to explain their positions, including Donald Trump. I strongly support the availability of IVF for couples who are trying to have a precious little beautiful baby. I support it. And the Senate GOP's campaign arm urging candidates to quote clearly and concisely reject efforts by the government to restrict IVF. The White House hitting back. This is the chaos that has come out of, uh, of getting rid, rid of rope. The same day as last week's ruling, Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Tom Parker shared his view that God wants conservative Christians to reshape society based on their beliefs. God created government. And the fact that we have let it go yeah. into the possession of others is heartbreaking. Can you point to Bun Bun? In Montgomery, Rebecca Matthews has one frozen embryo left after enduring three rounds of IVF. This feels almost like they're pushing us into a corner and, and um, punishing us for something that we can't control. How concerned are you that if you decide not to use this one embryo, that you could be held criminally or civilly liable? Very, I'm very concerned. The thought that this could land me in jail is just something that I can't even imagine. Those same concerns are what led at least three clinics in Alabama to stop IVF treatments. Alabama Fertility is one of them. 
Dr. Mimi McLean has had to tell patients the clinic is too concerned about legal liabilities to do IVF right now. The conversations that I've had to have this week have been some of the most heart-wrenching that I've ever had to have. I feel powerless. She hopes GOP leaders vocally backing IVF will turn things around. I think the national leaders serving their support behind our cause to provide IVF care in Alabama is incredibly powerful. Kelly Belmont is preparing for her second round of IVF. <laughs> So far, her clinic is still operating, yes. but she is terrified that could change. If IVF were to be stopped across the state, what would you be doing? Honestly, I think it'd be over for us. We had to pull from our 401k just to pay for what we've already done. The 38-year-old Belmonts feel like they're running out of time. It would literally be a dream crushed. Yamish Alcindor joins us now from Birmingham, Alabama. Yamish, there's now movement on legislation to protect IVF in Alabama, right? That's right. Both Democrats and Republicans in Alabama are pushing for legislation that would define an embryo outside of a person's body as not a child under state law. They hope that would restore access to IVF treatments in the state. Ellison. Yamish Alcindor, thank you. We want to turn now to Georgia, where a suspect has been taken into custody for the shocking death of a college student in the city of Athens. The 22-year-old nursing student had gone out for a morning jog, but never returned. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander is on the ground with the latest. After a terrifying 24 hours in the bustling college town of Athens, Georgia, tonight police have announced a suspect is in custody in what university officials say is the murder of 22-year-old Lakin Riley. University of Georgia police have identified a person of interest who is being questioned. We want to stress that this continues to be an active, ongoing investigation. Police say a friend of Riley's called 911 Thursday afternoon, saying Riley went for a morning run and never came back. Officers searched the area and within minutes found her body in an area around Lake Herrick near the school's intramural fields. The individual was unconscious and not breathing and had visible injuries. Here in Athens, the homicide has rocked two different campuses. Riley was a junior at Augusta University's College of Nursing, where she was on the dean's list. She had recently transferred from the University of Georgia. A student there until last spring, she remained active with her sorority. Today, classes on both campuses are canceled. How have these past 24 hours been? Um, honestly, I mean, it has been really hard on all of the students. I mean, everybody thinks that they're safe, but in reality, like, you never know. UGA senior Milka Ramirez lives right by the fields where Riley was found. I mean, that's very kind of concerning and scary just because that did happen very close by. And Blaine Alexander joins us now from Athens. Blaine, we know police just spoke a few moments ago about the suspect they have in custody. What more can you tell us? Well, Ellison, we know a lot more now. We know that the suspect is 26-year-old. His name is Jose Antonio Ibarra. Uh, he's somebody who uh, police say lives in Athens but is not a U.S. citizen, and he is being charged with a number of things tonight. He's being charged with malice murder, felony murder, aggravated battery, aggravated assault, kidnapping, along with several other uh, charges. We also learned some very disturbing things. We learned uh, that Lakin was killed by blunt force trauma, and we also learned that according to police officials, the two didn't know each other. They call it simply a crime of opportunity that he saw her out there and, quote, bad things happened. Ellison. Blaine Alexander in Athens, Georgia. Thank you. Now to the largest round of sanctions placed against Russia since the start of the war in Ukraine. The move from the Biden administration in response to the death of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. But will these sanctions have the desired effect? The Russian economy grew last year, backed by growing exports of oil to India, Brazil and China. And of course, spending related to the war effort. To break all of this down, uh, NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from the North Lawn of the White House. Uh, so, Gabe, one State Department official described this round of sanctions as crushing. What is it about these that they feel like might actually be or have a different impact than the previous rounds we've seen?
Well, Ellison, the White House says these new sanctions will build on previous ones that have slashed Russia's oil revenues by 40 percent, according to the Biden administration. The new sanctions target more than 500 people and companies that contribute to the Kremlin's war effort, including Russia's largest shipping company. The U.S. is also indicting more Russian businessmen. The White House says these latest sanctions are just the start and acknowledges they will only go so far. So the president is urging Congress to finish passing more aid for Ukraine. Mm. Elson? As Russia does find these markets outside of the United States and Europe, is there concern in the White House that without congressional action or some other sort of action, that these sanctions will become less and less effective over time? Yeah, Allison, it's not really clear how effective these sanctions will be. Vladimir Putin continues to get help from Iran, North Korea, and China. And that's partly why the U.S. and Europe are debating taking even more aggressive measures down the line, including seizing some $300 billion of frozen Russian assets. That's not part of this latest round of sanctions, but it could be on the table in the future. The U.S. would only be able to seize a fraction of that. Most of the assets are held in Europe. But, Ellison, yes, there is a concern that Russia will keep adapting to these sanctions as this war grinds on. Ellison. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. And staying with Russia, new details on the American citizen who remains in detention there. Russian-American Kesnia Karolina, who lives in Los Angeles, was detained and accused of treason by Russia, reportedly because of a small donation she made in support of Ukraine. Her boyfriend, boxer Chris Van Herden, is now speaking out about her case and pleading for help. Chris joins us now on Top Story. Chris, thank you so much for your time tonight, and I'm so sorry this is how we have to meet and talk with you. But to start, can you just tell us a little bit about your girlfriend? Tell us about Kesnia. We've seen all these amazing photos of her dancing. What is she like as a person? She is, she is happy. She is funny. She is full of life. And the kindest person I've come across. Mm. She gives with the whole heart. Without question, she puts others first. And we've had a few arguments about that because that's just what she do. She 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 walks into the room and everyone wants to be be around her. Mm. Kastia was visiting her grandmother in Russia when she was detained. Uh, can you tell us a little more about that trip? I mean, when she said she was going and got her flight and made those sorts of plans, were you worried at all about her safety as she went there? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, and I brought it up. I said, I don't think it's a good idea. I said, there's a war going on, and the relationship between Russia and America is not very good right now, and you are American. And she convinced me that I have nothing to worry about, the, no, no war in Russia, and... Where she grew up in Yekaterinburg is so far away from everything she said, and she did. She's very proud to be Russian as an American, and um, she convinced me. She said, "I'm Russian. I'm fine," and I said, "Okay." And I made silly jokes. I remember on the trip, I made a few silly jokes and said, "Well, let's enjoy these last few days because mm. I don't think I'm ever going to see you again." It was just silly jokes. Mm. When you look back on that now, and you think. You make those jokes sometimes because you don't think that that would ever really happen. When you think back to it now, how does it feel knowing what has happened? I just wish I didn't make those jokes. What do you want people to know about her? I mean, you have been in touch with her family over there. How are they dealing with this situation? Um, and do you think right now the United States is doing enough to get her home? Our family, our family is um, scared. They don't, they don't say much, but I can tell they're scared. And um, she's an American citizen, mm -hmm. and she's very proud to be an American citizen. That's why she's here. I'm sure there's something we can do. I'm sure there's the powers in the hands of America. In the right, uh, with with the right people, we can get her back. And I'm going to say no. I don't. I don't think we are doing enough because she's not here. It's been, it's been more than a month. And I want the people, the American people, to just know who Ksenia is. Mm -hmm. This is a normal person. She's a, she's a former ballerina, full-time esthetician, but she's a sweetheart. She's honestly, she's, she's a sweetheart. 
And all, I just, this all feels like a dream, like a nightmare, and I just want to wake up from it. I mean, hearing Russian authorities accuse her of treason, claiming that she'd given some sort of small donation to a Ukrainian charity. I mean, do you know anything about that? Had she given money? Uh, do you think they're just mm -hmm. coming up with an excuse to hold her because she has an American citizenship as well as her Russian citizenship? And, and they don't uh -huh. recognize dual citizens in Russia. I know Christina four years now. We've been romantically involved seven months. And in these last seven months, I can straight with a straight face tell you that she's never engaged in conversations about the war. She she just doesn't want to, it upsets her. Mm. I've she never been doing any donation funding while with me. Um but just listening to all of this, as I'm following the news, fifty-one dollars, and this is what she's going through. It just, it just it doesn't add up. It just doesn't feel real. I, I... When was the last time you were able to have a phone call or any sort of communication with her? I understand you did know about her detention for about a month, but you just weren't publicly able to speak about it. I mean, the agony of knowing something and not being able to make a public plea for help. How did you manage that? I don't know how I've managed it. January 27th is when the, the last time I spoke with her, and that's also when she was detained on January 27th, and I was told to, to keep my mouth shut. Um, and it was one of the hardest things I had to do because I knew what she was going through. And I wish, a part of me just wish I didn't keep my mouth shut and just voiced myself because maybe she would not have been this far into this. But I had to do what I was told. Chris, thank you so much for speaking to us and helping us to better understand your girlfriend and her situation. We will keep covering this, and our thoughts are with you and all of her friends and loved ones. Thank you for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Still ahead tonight, a verdict just in, in the civil corruption trial against the NRA. Wayne LaPierre found to have violated his duties as the head of the gun rights advocacy group, how much a jury says he cost the nonprofit. Plus, two beatings in New York City's famed Times Square just hours apart. The manhunt for more than a dozen suspects still on the run and a gas explosion engulfing this Michigan home in flames. How the 76-year-old man who lives in that house miraculously made it out alive. Top story is just getting started. Turning now to New York City, where police are searching for over a dozen people in connection with two violent attacks in Times Square last night. One man stabbed another beaten and both sent to the hospital. The violence sparking tough questions about order and public safety in America's largest city. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has this story. In this shocking Times Square surveillance video, a group mobbing a 17-year-old migrant, beating and stabbing him in the middle of a New York City street, according to the NYPD. Stunning bystanders and tourists. I see someone running and there's uh, cops pull him and there's someone with the cops jump and uh, catch him. Police recovering a large knife from the scene. Then, two hours later, and just blocks away, a verbal argument turning physical. A 28-year-old man repeatedly kicked and punched in the face by another group of assailants, according to police. Officers rushing to both scenes, making 10 arrests, but still on the hunt for 16 suspects. Both victims survived and were rushed to the hospital. And then this morning, a man was murdered on the city's subway in the Bronx. It's horrific. Nothing does a more chilling impact on our overall narrative that crime is down and jobs are up. Trust me, we will catch the people responsible for this. This afternoon, six of the suspects in last night's Times Square attacks charged with gang assault and two charged with criminal possession of a weapon. This week's violence, just the latest in a string of attacks plaguing New York City's Times Square. Two weeks ago, a 15-year-old Venezuelan migrant arrested in the shooting of a Brazilian tourist. The teen allegedly lashing out after being stopped by a security guard for suspected looting. A suspect takes out a 45 caliber handgun, shoots at her into a crowd. 
fault. The tourist said she heard a loud bang before seeing blood drip down her leg. And in January, two officers injured while trying to break up a group of teenage migrants. Authorities say it's all part of a troubling trend. And with these repeated attacks, there's worry that Times Square's reputation as one of the top tourist destinations in the world is now being called into question as authorities scramble to control the violence. Ellison. Aaron McLaughlin in Times Square. Thank you. Heading overseas, in Spain, a deadly fire burning through an apartment complex, killing at least 10 people and injuring more than a dozen. The effort underway now to find those still unaccounted for and to find the displaced residents some sort of temporary shelter. Tonight, a community in Spain devastated by a hellish fire that ripped through a 14-story apartment complex in Valencia killing at least 10 people, according to the city's mayor, and injuring another 15. This resident, still visibly in shock, saying she managed to tell her daughter and mother-in-law to leave just in time, but that others stayed inside. Firefighters rushing to the scene after the inferno erupted Thursday evening. This dramatic video showing first responders using a cherry picker to rescue two people trapped on a balcony as the flames closed in. Seis ingresadas. At a press conference today, officials saying some of the emergency workers received burns and one broken arm from a fall. Y afortunadamente, si hay alguna buena noticia esta mañana, es que no corre riesgo en este momento la vida de ninguna de esas 15 personas. Witnesses saying the blaze was fanned by strong winds and devastated the apartment block in just a half hour. There was no alarm or anything. There was no alarm. A representative for a Spanish insurance inspection agency telling local outlets that the building's use of a plastic material known as polyurethane helped the fire spread quickly. The scene reminiscent of the tragedy at London's Grenfell Tower in 2017 that killed more than 70 people. That blaze spreading rapidly due to flammable materials used on the building's facade. Spain's prime minister visiting the site of the fire today and saying the priority now is to search for the 14 people still missing. Valencia's mayor says more than 130 temporary homes are being prepared for residents who will also receive money for rent and daily expenses. Yes, everything, everything, documents, things, um, everything we, uh, we had. Some locals already stepping up, donating clothes, hygiene products and food. A community now trying to rebuild one kind gesture at a time. Coming up, a snow moon rising, the lunar event marking the beginning of the Lantern Festival and helping kick off Chinese New Year celebrations. We'll tell you how you can get the best view next. Stay with us. Back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with breaking news out of Missouri. A military helicopter crashing during a training exercise in Prentice County, killing two National Guardsmen, according to the governor. The AH-64 Apache going down just after 2 p.m. The identities of the service members have not been released. A verdict reached late today in the civil corruption trial against the National Rifle Association and its executives. A New York jury finding longtime NRA leader Wayne LaPierre violated his duties and cost the nonprofit $5.4 million. LaPierre and two other executives were accused of using the money to fund family vacations and trips on private jets. LaPierre resigned from the NRA earlier this year and has already paid back $1 million. A 76-year-old man somehow surviving multiple explosions at his house in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Take a look at this. You can see on police body camera video the moment the front wall of the house collapses. The man able to walk away from the blown out house with the help of the firefighter. He suffered a concussion but is expected to be okay. Authorities believe the blast was caused by a propane tank the homeowner was using for heat. 
and you might want to look up this weekend. The snow moon is set to rise, and it's going to be one of a kind. February's snow moon, the second of 2024, will be the farthest from the Earth and will appear the smallest in the sky. The snow moon will signal the start of the Lantern Festival, which is a part of the Chinese New Year celebrations. For the best view of the moonrise, look for a high spot facing east with a clear horizon. Now to the war in Ukraine, tonight marking the two-year anniversary of Vladimir Putin's full-scale invasion. The tide in that conflict shifting as Congress holds up billions of dollars in military aid. Some say the delay allowed Russian troops to make their biggest advance in nearly a year just last week. Today, a group of five Democratic senators traveling to Ukraine and meeting with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. As analysts expect Russia to carry out a series of attacks, including airstrikes, over the next 24 hours to mark the anniversary. For more on the anniversary of the full-scale invasion and what the future of Ukraine looks like, I'm joined now by Ukrainian activist Melania Podolak. Melania, it's so wonderful to have you here in person because we actually talked over two years ago, and that was one of the first stories we had on this program looking ahead to what might happen because Russia was building up tanks on the border when we spoke. This is February of 2022. I want to play some of what you had to say when I asked you what Americans should understand about Ukraine. I just wish people understood that, like, we're not a buffer state. Like, we are de facto, but, like, that's not our identity. When you look back on that now and the time that has passed, what do you want Americans to understand about it now? Do you feel like what you thought back then they do understand or no? First of all, thank you for having me. Um, a lot has changed, but if there's something that I understood about Ukrainians and Americans and what we have in common is that we're not that different. We're a freedom-loving country. We love our land. We love our people. And what is most important to us is our freedom and our safety. And this has been what we've been fighting for the, for the past two years. We're holding strong still. I mean, a lot of people would say that, you know, we didn't have enough of ammunition and that would mean the key would fall. Didn't happen, of course. We didn't get as much uh, ammunition and, and uh, everything as we wanted. But the fact still stands. We're going to do this. Uh, whatever it takes, uh, the morale is still very high. Ukrainians are very hopeful for the, you know, all the uh, upcoming support and whatnot. But, yeah, a lot has changed. We have changed as people. Uh, every single person has lost someone. And this makes this fight even more, you know, worth fighting for. Talk to us a little bit about that, because it is hard to go into Ukraine and not know someone, everybody you talk to will know someone who has been impacted by this, who has lost someone or who has been permanently mangled because of war. You lost a lot of close friends in the last two years. You also lost your boyfriend. Yeah. Can you talk to us about him and what the last two years have been like for you, how you've changed? Oh, well, yeah. Uh, me and my boyfriend, uh, Andriy Pilshikov, Carl St. Juice, was a fighter pilot, and we've met uh, in the spring uh, of last year. And uh, it, he was a different person, and I was already a different person, but then we changed each other, too. Uh, Andriy was a great advocate of the F-16 program for Ukraine. He actually made it here to the States to advocate. Uh, he did everything that he could as a, you know, as a leader, as, as a military personnel in Ukraine to make sure these things happen. And this is exactly why um, everything feels personal, because, you know, not only is it, you know, that F-16s, for instance, are of utmost importance to Ukraine, but also it's a fact that we lost so many people because of the stalling and, the, you know, taking, you know, everybody's taking their time with supplying Ukraine what we've asked for. So it's really, it's personal for every Ukrainian. You can feel that every single life that has been lost was, in fact, due to, to the reason that, you know, people were afraid to help Ukraine win, it feels like. I hope these things change, and I hope that, you know, we have a different outlook on this, and I hope that our partners, and, I mean, they do realize we're doing very well in this fight, but we need more to, to succeed. You know, it's not just a matter of not letting the patient die, uh, you know, be, die, it's keeping him alive, but it's a matter of getting better. And so for me, for instance, this thing, Andri never got to fly an F-16 and will never, unfortunately. Um, and so it, it all has to make sense this way. Like, um, his death will be for nothing if Ukraine does not gain the, the equipment we ask for and if we don't win this war this way. And this is why, you know, some people call it politics, you know, like give Ukraine this, give Ukraine that. But after all, 
under all of that, there is a story of every person there. Okay. And very quickly before we go, do you still have absolute faith and confidence that Ukraine can and will win this war? Oh, 100 um, percent. Here in Ukraine, all over the world, not just Ukrainian, but everybody believes this will happen, as evident by tomorrow's rallies all over the world. I, by the way, invite everybody to join. Um, the Ukraine still hold strong, and as long as we have our partners by our side and the resolve to help Ukraine, this world will be over in no time, and the, you know, the kind of ideas and values we stand for will be preserved. Thank you for being here, and thank, thank you. you for telling us about Andriy. Mania Podolak. Stay with us, because we will be right back. Back now with the latest stop on Taylor Swift's wildly popular Eras Tour. The superstar kicking off the Australian leg of the tour. Fans pouring in from all corners of the country, even as torrential rain and lightning forced a temporary evacuation. NBC's Megan Fitzgerald has more. Taylor Swift mania has made its way down under and the Aussies coming out in droves. The pop phenom's first of four sold-out concerts in Sydney kicked off today. And to say these diehard fans braving rain and stormy weather are excited is an understatement. We've come here. I don't care if I get struck by lightning. I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy to take one for the team. So, yeah, just happy to be here. But the lightning and bad weather caused the concert to be delayed. Fans even having to temporarily evacuate for their own safety. But the weather wasn't enough to stop fans from coming in from across the region. And we drove down for 10 hours playing Taylor Swift on repeat just to come watch her at the Aeros tour. And even Sydney Airport getting pumped, tweeting this picture of a plane with lyrics from Swift's song, Blank Spaces. And among the 80,000 who packed the arena for opening night, celebrities like Katy Perry and Rita Ora both posting on Instagram. Perry posting, got to see an old friend shine tonight. Aura saying Tay Tay always delivers and posted this photo with Swift's boyfriend, NFL star Travis Kelsey, who flew in Thursday fresh off a Super Bowl win. He and Swift seen holding hands and feeding kangaroos at the Sydney Zoo. But the excitement for Swift also felt by local businesses and economies where she tours. Business Sydney is expecting to see a massive economic boost to the tune of 133 million Australian dollars from Swifties descending on the city. So it's not just fans who are stoked about Tay Tay. It's a win-win for every city Swift sweeps through. Megan Fitzgerald, NBC News, London. Thanks so much for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Ellison Barber in New York. Stay right there. More news now is on the way. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.